Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna spend some time today talking about um, the business of TV everywhere. Uh, we're gonna get an update from practitioners in the space. Um, you know, I'd like to make sure we try and cover off what's working, what's not working. Try and look at this from the consumer point of view, from the network point of view, from the MVPD point of view. Um, we don't. Our Comcast participant is not here today, so. Um, but I'm sure everybody else would be happy to comment on the MVPD point of view. Uh, I'm the uh, Vice President of Business Development at Roku. Uh, I, among other things, I write uh, distribution deals with content partners. I'm also responsible for our uh, endemic advertising business, basically helping partners acquire users on Roku. Um, we are uh, just, we just crossed five million boxes in field. Our average user does about 12 hours per week, so about a quarter to a third of all viewing in our households happens on the Roku. We are unfairly labeled as a uh, cord cutting box. Uh, we're actually very bullish on TV everywhere. I'm excited to be here today. We think it's a you know, really important part of how over the top and uh, connected devices grow up and uh, really blow out content choice. So I'm excited to be here. I just want to do, um, we're going to do some intros, but I want to do a couple of um, straw polls here. So. Who's got a cable, satellite, telco subscription today? Well, who doesn't? Okay, you can leave. This is not, <laughs> okay. this is not about you. Um, yeah, right. Um, so who's used a TV Everywhere experience from an MVPD before? Time Warner, Optimum, okay. So maybe 50%. Who's used a TV Everywhere experience from a network in HBO and A&E? Uh, and epics. Okay. Who hasn't used it? Who has never used a, so don't be embarrassed, it's okay. Okay. Whose mother or mother-in-law has actually used a TV Everywhere experience? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'd like to drill a little bit on sort of what's working about TV Everywhere and we're all in the industry so I think it'd be useful to also try and understand um, uh, or imagine what the average consumer is uh, going through as they get into these experiences. So, so with that, um, I'd like to ask each of the panelists here to spend five minutes just introducing themselves and talking about their own uh, efforts in TV Everywhere, and then, we'll, and then we'll go from there. We'll leave about 10, 15 minutes at the back end for questions. Nora? Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, well, I'm with Epix. Epix is a premium network. We're owned by uh, three movie studios. It's a joint venture of Paramount, Lionsgate and MGM. So as you can imagine, we are very focused on movies. Um, movie fans are our are, are main target, although we do comedy and, and music events and we make original documentaries as well. We launched about three and a half years ago. So we're really the newest premium network. Uh, and we were designed from the very beginning for TV Everywhere, um, designed for the the emerging uh, viewing habits. In fact, we launched our website before we launched our, our linear channel. But you would subscribe to us via cable satellite, telco companies. You would access us on uh, game console, hundreds of different devices um, uh, as an authenticated subscriber. We're also available uh, via digital retailers Netflix, Amazon, um, and Redbox uh, by Verizon. So we see the opportunity out there. We love it that there's a growing mix of retailers in the marketplace, and we are you know, happy to design for that. Um, our subscribers, we're, we're proud to say, are watching more than the average subscriber on multiple platforms. And uh, they are more familiar than the average subscriber uh, with the notion of authentication and with the need to authenticate. Um, however, these are still insanely early days. Um, while our subscribers are you know, watching at a higher rate than average, television is still by and by a long shot the first stop it's still you know two thirds of of the universe and and this and this goes for broadly as well in terms of people um, anybody look at the entire universe of broadband consumers people who have a choice two thirds of them still turn first to uh, to the television the big television set 
Um, then they turn to all the alternative devices and platforms as a second set option because the main TV might not be available to them or for personalized viewing, uh, largely for marathoners or very much so for younger viewers and for the affluent who can afford all these devices. Um, we completed some recent research which just confirms that while these are the early days, uh, we're all very much on the right track. What we see is a little bit of common sense, but it's always great to see it borne out in the data that uh, flexibility is really, flexibility of platforms and of access is really driving value. By that I mean um, the subscribers who are viewing on multiple, the more platforms and devices upon which a subscriber is viewing, the happier and more satisfied that subscriber is. Happier with epics, this is among our epics universe. Happier in general across premium networks. I'm sure HBO sees the same thing. But what's really great is um, there's a halo effect those folks are also happier with their pay TV distributor, their provider, whether that's Comcast or Time Warner or um, uh, Dish, whatever. The more platforms they're accessing, the more engaged they are, the more value they see, and, and, and the happier uh, they are at any price. So um, what, what we think, what we see the attributes driving that are uh, this flexibility of access number one, and number two, um, ease of search. And uh, that is where I think in TV everywhere, the internet connected um, devices are pretty far out ahead, frankly, than the MVPDs, the, the more traditional distributors. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say by way of introduction, I don't know if I've used up my introductory thing, is this, is this is very much a continuum. Um, first there was cable which was a, a new platform and it brought us, it brought us uh, uh, a new picture to areas that couldn't even get reception and it, brought, it, was, it was the advent of these specialized channels, kids and news and all of that. Then along came satellite, the next platform, and that brought us a better picture. They introduced digital and it drove some new channels as well and, it, and, and uh, introduced HD, a better picture. And finally, telco then came along which uh, introduced and drove higher broadband, faster broadband rates. So on top of that, next we see internet-connected television. It's the fourth platform. The great news for all the previous platforms is it's not an instead of. It's an in addition to. Consumers are using a whole continuum. They're putting together a whole combination, and they're drawing on from, that's why I'm a believer, too, in TV everywhere although we are a long way from realizing it. I guess I'll wrap up at this point. Sean? Sure. Uh, Sean Knapp, uh, one of the co-founders and uh, chief product officer at Uyala. Uh, we're, we're probably the brand that I'm guessing most folks here haven't heard of, uh, primarily because uh, we, we don't have a consumer brand. Uh, we provide technology platform and services uh, to imagine a lot of folks like you guys uh, to actually provide an, an online media experience. Uh, from a, a perspective of a scale, uh, we reach over 100 million unique users on a monthly basis across our platform. Uh, we power customers like ESPN and Bloomberg here domestically, uh, Sinopolis and, and Caracol uh, out of Latin America, as well as some of the top broadcasters and, and uh, networks really worldwide. Uh, we've been executing uh, to their strategies and, and our global strategy for about six years now as a private company uh, and essentially helping uh, folks deliver on everything from the TV Everywhere strategies to purely ad-supported models. And it's given us a very interesting uh, perspective on the overall evolution of the industry. You know, we've watched it from the early days when online video uh, didn't just mean a new screen, which, which we very firmly believe. Uh, it meant a new screen, uh, new forms of content oftentimes. Uh, we joke cats doing backflips. Uh, but oftentimes then that was accompanied by entirely new business models. Uh, this is one of the founding reasons as to why we, we built Uyala to begin with was we realized that, that the existing business models to be found in the online world simply could not sustain the industry. Uh, and, and we've watched similar models of, of cannibalization take hold of other industries and actually undermine the overall creation aspect uh, that we all really depend on. So as, we, as we've built Uyala over the course of time, 
uh, we've invested very heavily in delivering on a lot of what Nora uh, is talking to, which is how do we build uh, a truly unique, uh, accessible everywhere uh, and truly personalized content experience uh, for each and every single consumer. You know, you'll hear one of the trends that, and one of the themes that comes uh, from us is, you know, first uh, knowing uh, very much who your users are, what they're consuming, uh, and being able to personalize that uh, content experience for them. Uh, we collect about two billion events on a daily basis uh, through our analytics platform that help us understand uh, the profiles of the user, their behavioral patterns, and how we ultimately best personalize that experience for them. Uh, we also provide all of this uh, analytics data back to our customers uh, with deep insights on what should be the right ad load, what should be uh, the right subscription bundles, and how do they best actually provide a package to their users, whether you're trying to retain them uh, or whether you're trying to actually convert brand new users into, into your business. Uh, so across all of those customers, you know, I can tell you we have about half of our customers uh, operate uh, domestically, half internationally, uh, a large percent in purely ad-supported models, uh, a pretty aggressively growing trend uh, towards authenticated. Uh, we've uh, done integrations with pretty much every uh, major MSO and MVPD domestically, as well as a number of international ones. Uh, and what we're seeing is a very strong trend towards this migration of the offline world of just 200 channels, you know, the, the classic uh, A and E, uh, you know, TBS, et cetera, to a world where we're actually getting uh, one channel for each and every single consumer, uh, and a truly personalized experience uh, powered by uh, a much deeper and richer layer of data uh, that's leveraging that one-to-one that -one dialogue uh, with each and every single consumer. Hey, everybody. I am uh, Evan Silverman. I'm SVP of digital media for a and &E Networks. a and &E Networks is a and &E history lifetime and then a bunch of other uh, networks in our portfolio, H2, LMN, Bio, um, and a few smaller ones. We launched our TV Everywhere product in mid-December, so we're about six months in. Uh, we launched on the iPad uh, an app for each of the three main networks for A&E, for History and for Lifetime. Uh, we followed that up in mid-February um, on the iPhone, and we are uh, set to release on Android in early June. Um, it's been a... Uh, it's been an extremely positive experience, greater than we even thought. Um, so we've had our four best months for total video views of all time, January through April of 13. Um, and that's obviously the time that our, our uh, TV Over product was live, both with the apps and online. Um, we have found that all of the viewing has been additive, um, not cannibalistic. About a third of our overall video views are coming from our TV Everywhere apps on iOS. Uh, if you had asked me in December before we launched what I thought that percentage would be, I would have maybe said 5 to 10 percent out of the gate. Um, so we've been extremely encouraged by that. Um, we are currently uh, authenticating with Comcast Xfinity, with DirecTV, and some regional providers. Um, and we hope to announce um, additional authentication partners uh, throughout the year. And uh, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a misconception, I think, in the industry that TV Everywhere is this difficult, crazy, hard to understand concept. Um, and I think if you make it simple and straightforward for uh, your audience, it's, it's not that bad. I think if you look in the industry and you've seen the adoption during sporting events, whether it's the Olympics, March Madness, um, you know, when the content is there, um, people do find a way to uh, figure out their, their login from their MVPD. I think that's one of the most overstated uh, you know, problems with TV ever. It's really not that hard. The issue is primarily, can you authenticate? Do, you know, have networks, do networks have deals with distributors? Um, and is the content there? Have people secured the rights? So we are very optimistic. We're going to be, um, like I said, rolling out with additional distributors and on um, a lot more platforms beyond iOS and Android. Um, so stay tuned. Great, thank you. So that's a good setup <clears throat> for my first question, which is, um, you know, how good a job are we doing at informing consumers of the TV Everywhere opportunity? And then <clears throat> should we get them to our doorstep? Um, what's the experience like today? And what, what can we be doing as an industry to streamline it or make it better? You see, maybe you should follow on your last comment. Sure. So I, I think we as an industry are doing a lousy job uh, promoting TV everywhere. 
Um, my own sister this weekend said to me, you guys have an app for Lifetime? Um, why don't you promote that? Um, and it was a good point. Um, I, I do think um, there's a natural progression to our business and the deals that uh, network groups like A&E have with the MVPDs. Um, one of the reasons I think TV Everywhere has been slow um, to adoption is it just takes time for these agreements to be worked out. And, and most companies are not opening these agreements um, just for TV Everywhere. So <coughs> there's a cycle as more and more uh, companies sign up distributors and authentication partners, then I think we as an industry will be more aggressive to promote TV Everywhere. One of the reasons a &E Networks hasn't, we've decided not to be as aggressive as we could is because we're still waiting to onboard additional providers and we don't want to attract uh, large audiences um, of, of viewers who can't authenticate yet. I'm going to throw it to, to, I have a follow up and then I'm going to throw it to you guys for, for additional. So, <coughs> so um, Evan, in your opinion, the, the, um, the MVPD login is not an issue, it's an overstated I wouldn't Problem. say it's not an issue, but I think it's an overstated issue. It, okay. You know, people somehow figured out a lot to log into Netflix or to Facebook, and it's really not that different. Yeah. The issue is, is there a value proposition that makes you want to log in? And if the content is there as it was for sporting events and, you know, for a and &E, I'd like to say, yeah. people, people log in and they figure it out. Okay. I'll let one of you guys. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I'd say it, there has to be a value prop, right? You know, it's... Like a, a lot of folks now, right? I have my my nice, pretty plasma team or plasma TV sitting at home, and if I'm home, I'm, I'm more likely than not going to watch, you know, the sporting event or some other, you know, activity on the big screen TV. Uh, where we see, I think, a lot of the TV everywhere experience start to displace that is, uh, you know, one in the bedroom on a tablet if it's mid or long form content uh, <coughs> on mobile if I'm actually not in front of a TV, and, and I think that talks to the cannibalization. Conversation. I'd love to circle back on, on cannibalization because I think it, that's a, a, a very tricky term. Um, and, and then you know, I, I think um, even beyond that, where we see a lot of people tuning in for TV everywhere is when they have access to content that they can't get elsewhere. So, for example, uh, we power Pac-12 networks, uh, iOS, and, and web apps. Uh, they actually have seven linear feeds, you know, but for each sort of uh, one of the, the six regions in a national feed. But when I turn on Comcast, I only get one of those. Uh, I grew up in Washington, went to school in California. Uh, so when I actually want to watch a UW football game, I have to actually go and watch it on my iOS app because odds are I won't be able to get it if there's a, a Stanford or Cal game instead. Uh, so this goes back to the, the value prop, right? There has to be something more there than just turning on my TV because the screen's bigger and it just works, right? And so we, do, we are asking people to go through a few hoops. You're, you're absolutely right. We went through the same thing with Pac-12 as they on, onboarded on uh, more uh, authenticated systems is, and when you first started, I think we had Dish first, uh, they didn't want to market that because what happens with all of the Comcast folks, right? West Coast, Comcast pretty dominant. You want to market and then have 80% of your market come on and realize they're Comcast subscribers and they can't do anything with it. So it, it, it's both, the, I think, the, some of the, the hurdles which we're working through and then it's the value prop to the end consumer. I, I actually think there are, there are I would echo what, what you guys are saying. I, I, would, I also think that from the MVPD side of it, um, there are some historical trends that suggest that this is going to be slow going for a while, too. Um, I think we're doing a terrible job of educating. Even I, I understand why an A&E wouldn't jump out. When you're not ready, you're not, the network isn't promoting. But even among the, the distributors that do make TV Everywhere available, I don't think the education is there. When you look at um, uh, broadband consumers, again, this, this survey that we just did, less than 25% of broadband consumers even understood or had a sense of what is TV everywhere. Um, that, that's really a huge barrier. People don't know what it is because they're not really being systematically educated about it. Um, and I think the historical thing that makes me a little nervous about how fast this is really going to catch on, you know, I don't know, I've never had my, uh, my cable provider tell me what is my password. I'm, I, if, if I wasn't in the business, I would never in a thousand years have thought I have to go find my password. Um, video on demand, maybe some of you saw an article on the front page of the New York Times today, or, or the front, 
part of the business section about how video on demand has finally hit it and has really kind of come into its own. Yeah. This is the set-top box video on demand. It has been over a decade in the making. You don't really know where your video on demand channels are. You don't really know when they finally got to prime time where all my networks, my favorite network shows, I've never once been really communicated with. I just kind of had to find my way to it. Well, that's how TV everywhere so far is getting rolled out. And I'm not talking about the network side. Uh, I'm talking about your distributor side. And you know, are, are, we, are we really educating yet? No, absolutely not. And so it won't really hit a uh, critical threshold until we're educating more effectively. Now, I think both these guys just mentioned, though, the key drivers will be these events whether it's sports events or other kinds of events. And as a movie network, we have, we have less opportunity for that. But um, when we launched our app on Xbox, it was part of a big, we were first network on Xbox, first network on Roku, yes. we're really proud to say. And the, the Ro our Roku subscribers are the most engaged subscribers that we have in terms of our TV Everywhere device activity. Just I'll give that, that I'll, I'll toss that out there. Um, but when we launched on Xbox, Xbox was doing a big promotion. We saw, our, our distributors saw doubled authentication rates in that window because Xbox was promoting. We were bundled with Xbox as they were selling the new, the new machines just as they were, the new consoles, just as they were getting into the entertainment business. There was a lot of promotion. We were promoted on the box. There was an insert in there. And our authentication rates doubled in that window. So there, there are these events, whether it's a big sporting event that you must see, or whether there's some sort of a promotional moment, those are the things that bring us, um, are, are, some, um, are some critical points. But until there's a better, more systematic um, focus on education, I think it's going to be kind of slow going. So just to clarify your comment before I ask the ne your next, uh, next question, uh, is it your supposition that the MVPDs are not educating consumers about a history or an epics experience, or they're not educating consumers about their own TV Everywhere experience, or both? I, I, I would say they're not educating about TV Everywhere as a general concept, because really for me to be authenticated, I have to know my password. I have to know that there is such a thing and that there is a process in place. I have no problem with epics needing to go out into the world and educate and promote what we have available, and A and and A and E will do the same thing. But um, as a subscriber, working with a certain distributor, do I really have I heard from them about the fundamental process of of what is my password and and how do I go about that? So they're not, not to drill on this too much, but they're not marketing it in part because of the complexity of the messaging around it, or I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I I don't I. I so wish this, our Comcast there, guy was here. Is there here. value for Comcast to market it right well, now? Well, actually, I do know. This, this, I, get, I, this lays up the next. This is the question yeah. I want to get to. So, He's been building to something yeah. you so, can tell. So this is kind of a setup. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'd like to for each of the panelists here to comment on the varying incentives for an MVPD versus a network to market TV everywhere. Um, we have both. I'm going to come back and ask a question about sort of how we should think about those two different consumer experiences. But let's talk from a business perspective about the varied incentives of those two parties outside of technical obstacles mm -hmm. to, uh, to market TV everywhere. And I'm sure nobody in this room buys or sells programming, so it's a safe environment, say whatever you want. <laughs> Evan, you want to start? Um, sure. I mean, we have an incentive to get our networks, our brands, front of mind with our consumers. Um, you know, the MVPDs pay us a lot of money, and we have a great business model, and uh, we want to keep that in place um, for a long time. Um, but, you know, if a direct-to-consumer world ever comes years from now, we want to be top of mind with, with folks. So um, it's important that people consume video on our platforms, um, and they utilize our TV Everywhere experience. Um, I obviously don't work for an MVPD, but I think it's in Comcast or another MVPD's best interest to uh, promote their Xfinity platform mm -hmm. um, and to remain top of mind with their consumers. Um, so, you know, I think, again, I come back to our, our industry talks a lot about, oh, we need to do this big education campaign around TV Everywhere. I don't think the consumer sits there and says, explain to me TV Everywhere. The consumer sits there and says, I want to watch an episode of Duck Dynasty tonight. 
And if, if we, a &E Networks, decide to put that behind the authentication wall, and they care enough about that episode, they will figure out how to log in. And I think that's what we are trying to do at a and &E Networks. We have actually um, been less aggressive about pushing that authentication wall to make it a great experience to people. They use our app. They watch three times um, the amount of videos on the TV ever experience in an app than they do online. Right? So we, we, have, we have found a, a touch point where consumers are happy with the experience. And then if they want to watch more, that's when we push uh, the authentication and TV everywhere product. But once we have more distributors signed up, we will be aggressively pushing TV everywhere, more so than we do now. Yeah, I, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, well, I think the motivation for, for um, MVPDs to be promoting TV everywhere is, is, is very clear because the more their subscribers are accessing this content, the more they're actually utilizing broadband delivery, the higher speeds they need, the more broadband service they're selling, and that is a new revenue opportunity for them. I, uh, I, I, I'm watching a lot of online video. I want faster speeds in my house. You can upgrade me. You can charge me more today mm -hmm. for that. So, and 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 the, the 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 cable MSOs have done a fantastic job actually of selling incremental services and upgraded services and developing more revenue. So I think they I think they're going to be pretty clear about seeing a new revenue opportunity. Number one. Number two. The more engaged across the more platforms, the happier the subscriber with the distributor. So that's a happier, that's a happier customer. Mm. And finally, I think that what, what I feel that we're seeing is when people are engaging on these platforms and looking at the on-demand programming, it actually feeds viewership overall. It does not, we, we, we're not seeing, um, we're not seeing uh, any kind of um, uh, reduction on the main viewing. If anything, we're seeing the series on linear television get renewed, get broader audiences, because if you missed an episode, you can go back and see it. If you missed a first season, you are not forever out of the loop. You can go back and catch up. So it's actually uh, um, a virtuous cycle, and more people come into the fold on these networks. So I actually think these are, these are all motivations for all of us to be, to be focused on TV mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah, as the arms dealer in the room, can I say that? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, we see value in, in both sides, right? It, ultimately, whoever controls the, the consumer experience uh, and that entry point uh, is in a, a much stronger power position. Uh, we see it from a slightly different vantage point in that, you know, we see it from sort of the, the evolutionary timeline of the industry uh, and have seen the, the networks effectively move first, right? It, Online it provides one of, the, one of the first opportunities to have a direct conversation with the consumer in a, in a way that wasn't otherwise possible before. Uh, it should terrify the MVPDs. Uh, in, in this world where every network, for example, had uh, essentially a, a TB Everywhere solution, they wouldn't necessarily have to uh, have their own Comcast, wouldn't have to have Xfinity, for example. Uh, but at that point, which, you know, how much value do they provide? And, as you know, the percentage of all video consumption moves from about, it's about 10% happens online right now based on hours of content consumed. As that starts to move to 20 to 30 to 40%, uh, at what point in time do you expect you know, a &E or you know, ESPN or the others, actually though they already are, the ones out ahead, start to offer their own packages, right? And, and actually uh, start to disintermediate. Uh, that poses a huge threat long term. Uh, I think there will be a, a competitive dynamic that does shake out over time. Uh, TBD, who wins beyond the consumers, <laughs> I, I think obviously do win. Uh, and I think those who do win long term will probably be the ones that are able to provide the most compelling experiences. Um, and, and that's why we actually see, uh, while the networks have been moving first in mass, uh, we see that, uh, that their counterparts are moving much more aggressively today. We're going to come back to the virtual MSO discussion. We'll save that for the end because uh, that's a juicy one um, and a hard one. And we'll take another straw poll. But you raised an, an interesting question on the way, which I'd like folks to comment on, which is how should the how should a consumer? I appreciate your point, Evan, about um, consumers don't go looking for TV everywhere; they look for experiences. But how? What what does? I, I don't believe we have a world in which you open up one of 20 or 30 different TV Everywhere apps. That's not, that's not a good, 
there is a role for an aggregator here, but how should we think about sort of a, a TV Everywhere experience brought to you by your MVPD, as well as TV Everywhere experiences brought to, brought to you by each of your favorite networks? What, what, is, what is the consumer um, decision process for deciding what to download, what to use, and, and what's the value that the consumer gets out of each of those? Well, right now it's on. mostly the network. Right now, it, the, 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 all the action is, <coughs> that, that we see not just with Epics, but across it. Viewers are downloading network apps and, and, and they're engaging with network apps more than they are with the MVPD because they understand the proposition, they understand, they go looking for the show. So, so um, that, that's what, where they're drawn. Is it, is, uh, do you have any, do you have numbers, downloads, or usage to, to support that? I mean, so in other words, if we summed up Optimum and X Xfinity and Time Warner and all their TV Everywhere usage, would we find that that, that, that usage is actually lower than the aggregate usage of uh, networks TV Everywhere experiences? Well, I, I, guess, I, don't, I haven't seen that data, that's why I'm asking. I, yeah, I guess I, guess I, would, I would, I guess I would take a step back yeah. and suggest it's not really either or though. Um, the consumer who downloads the Epix app is an authenticated customer of let's say Cox or Verizon, so they are the customer. Now whether the consumer views Epix from their linear channel or the set-top box video on demand or as an authentic authenticated customer via Roku or on Xbox shouldn't really matter to Cox or Verizon um, because it's a happier customer. They haven't lost that customer. It's, uh, it, it's really more a mall, and you can walk into the mall through the main front door into the general lobby and then choose your stores, or you can enter uh, through the Macy's door if you mm. want to go to Macy's. Mm. It's, I, I, I really think that it's not this or that. It's as many points of access as easy as possible is really what we should all aim for. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's this, this disintermediation is on the near horizon because I think the economics, Evan mentioned it, the economics are profound for, for the networks. Um, there are huge audiences that are well entrenched and that litany of platforms that I talked about before, each new platform didn't put the previous one out of business. Um, I, I, think that, I think that people will continue to see value in paying for one bill and, and buying a bundle of channels from one provider, um, but I don't think that they want to be limited by having to use the Xfinity app versus the A&E app. <coughs> they'll, they'll use all of it. So the enlightened MVPD, the enlightened network is ambivalent about whether a user comes in through their own TV should everywhere. Be agnostic. Should be should, should be, be agnostic, okay. yeah. Okay, why well, don't you guys, uh, yeah, <laughs> Evans, you're, you're, you're... So I agree. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're, yeah, we, we all come from you know, different vantage points, but largely agree. Uh, I, I think there's a, a, a couple of nuances. You know, one, you know, you guys will always be able to provide a, a more engaging experience with your brands mm -hmm. than Comcast will ever be able to, right? Because you can actually tailor that experience to your content, your demographics, et cetera. Uh, I think, you know, kind of per your, your shopping mall uh, example, where we, you know, will ultimately see it, I think, is Comcast will still, um, you know, they have a, a huge, are able to provide a huge amount of value as an aggregator. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a world where, let's say, every network has their own application, uh, how does Comcast still help facilitate the aggregation model? Uh, I would not be surprised to see that as the TV everywhere industry evolves, you'll see as part of these, you know, uh, authentication models, there will also be requirements to promote other network applications as part of that uh, MVPD and integration, right? So, you know, you have your uh, Comcast or your Dish logo on top, but you have to be able to provide other navigation to other applications to help facilitate more discovery across that. Uh, otherwise, I do think it poses, and again, I mean, we're talking, this industry doesn't move that fast, like mm -hmm. it long ways out. Right. Uh, but it does start to pose some threat as people focus more on, on individual brands, which isn't necessarily bad over time, but that's certainly a very slow trend that we run the risk of, of walking down. I'm not quite sure what the question is right now, but uh, <laughs> it's, it started as a question. Sorry, we sort of were. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think I think it's crucially important for us to have a customer in a network environment, and where you know if you're watching Pawn Stars, you're you know the only next option is to watch American Pickers on History, um, and that's why I think we are so focused on our own platforms. Mm -hmm. um, yes, an MVPD benefits from folks authenticating on our our platform, but. Uh, you know, as this world changes, we need to maintain as much control as possible. And these TV Everywhere apps um, that we control, it, it's crucial, you know, that we just, we don't have sort of the competition to deal with in that. And so we put a lot of our energy into our own apps versus, you know, folks watching it on an MVPD, on an, on an Xfinity, for example. Great. Okay. Related question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is there, let's just talk from a network perspective today, is there new money, found money in the TV Everywhere experience? Are there things that can be delivered around the edges or outside of the core content offering that exists in, um, in the linear experience that a network can pursue so that TV Everywhere, I mean, you've sort of highlighted sort of the long-term vision of you know, this is this is a long-term right. play for the network strategy. There's the marketing objective; it increases loyalty and engagement. But is there is there a short-term new revenue opportunity to be had uh, for networks? And of course, you are very different kinds of networks. So, but wouldn't high-speed broadband be the first and biggest for the MVPD? But how about for for Epic? Ah, well. I guess um, if I can build, I, I'm looking to have the greatest number of consumers who are the happiest and most engaged with me. Mm -hmm. I'm not really that focused on selling them something else. I'm looking at reaching as many of them as possible. So the people who are able to access us through TV everywhere wind up being our core, actually wind up being the core movie fan audience. They're the ones, just, as, just echoing what, what you guys have been saying, they're looking for a movie and they have found us on every platform possible. So I feel that um, for Epix, it's less about what is our next revenue opportunity and it's more about how do we really establish a good, strong customer subscriber base. And the other piece of it is that you guys have alluded to, and now we can have a relationship with, with these folks. That's, that's a huge shift from earlier where we did not have email addresses, we couldn't really reach out to them, and now that gives us an opportunity. So, but there is also the uh, what I hear embedded in your comment is there is the prospect of reduced churn, and, and so that that's yes that's more money on yeah. the table. Is TV Everywhere a good uh, acquisition tool for a, for a premium network? For the next generation, it sure is, okay. which I, we haven't really touched on yet. But um, this is. Uh, such a fundamental issue across the whole industry. Um, uh, older folks are watching mostly linear television, and then you get down. To, then you get <coughs> to a little bit younger, and they're watching video on demand on the set-top box in linear television. And then you get into kids who are watching on, you know, constantly on their mobile phone or on any of the devices and on Xbox and PS3 and, and all of that. Um, as those kids grow up and start their own households, we could stand, that's where I think your point is well taken. We, we could run the risk of losing that generation if we don't engage them now and establish viewership habits that, that um, makes them engage with our brand on this has platform. A, so, yeah, it has a long-term impact on carriage fees and, and, and beyond. Yeah, I mean, so you asked, is, is TV Ever a new revenue stream? Um, you know, do the MVPDs pay us extra to, for TV Everywhere? That wasn't exactly what I asked. We're, we're not, we're not going to comment <laughs> on that. Um, I think we think of it a little bit longer term. It's, it's foundational to our business. Um, it is the way in which we can continue to serve the customer, continue to um, keep an existing business model um, or something close to it. Um, so, you know, yes, I think there's tremendous new revenue there, but maybe it's in a long-term yeah. uh, view. 
Okay, one last uh, question, slightly off topic before we, we turn to the audience. So you're over under on a virtual MVPD play, virtual MSO play in the next 12 months. Succeeding or coming to market? <laughs> or launching, yeah. <laughs> launching. Yes. Sean, go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I think it will. From the uh, arms dealer. Yes, from the arms dealer. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, there will be one, if not more. Um, I think the uh, the challenge uh, will be uh, the whole question around unbundling. Uh, we tend to ascribe to the philosophy that unbundling very likely will not happen, uh, or it will happen and at a price point that most consumers do not expect. Uh, as a result, right, you'll be paying, you know, HBO Go and uh, ESPN Watch prices for content, not the, you know, the five buck carriage fee that you think you're paying. Uh, we also, at, at the same time, if you look at the models and a lot of the sort of tangential investments that uh, a lot of the, uh, the MVPDs are, are making in the industry, uh, pretty much everybody's standing up their own CDN. This provides a really nice way of sort of finagling your way through the whole net neutrality question and start to make it very expensive for others to deliver into your network and very cheap for you to stand up uh, a TV Everywhere uh, offering that's very different, right? You know, we do a lot of our business internationally. Uh, and in foreign countries, you know, there's a lot of other uh, issues around metered and unmetered traffic, for example, that we actually expect will start to play out here, uh, but under a slightly different notion uh, as we still struggle over time with net neutrality. So I'll take the under. Yes, there'll be a virtual MVPD. Uh, will they succeed? I'm not optimistic in the short term. I, I, I go back to... Um, so, and I should also say, we welcome virtual MVPDs into the market. Any uh, competitors who are willing to pay more uh, for our content <laughs> is a good thing. Um, but I have yet to hear a uh, virtual MVPD that I think has, you know, secured enough rights and created a, a valuable enough experience that would get folks to, to change. And until that happens, um, I think it's a difficult road to hoe. So consumer experience is not so compelling that it, it happens and the content lineup is deficient and the pricing is not. Um, I, I think that the pricing will be <coughs> in line with what you see from existing uh, providers. Oh yeah, an upstart virtual MVPD can go, or oh, they'll take it on the chin and <laughs> subsidize it? Or how, how to <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at the stuff, for example, that, that you know, we hear coming out of Intel, uh, clearly they have the budget to make this work. Uh, Do they? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, fair, I'm not fair. being sarcastic. It, you know how much money it costs to to buy a. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it clearly costs a lot of money, uh, but I mean, it, it, Intel is very different than, than say a you know a startup coming out of Silicon Agreed. Valley. Agreed. Uh, and you know, as we look at it, you know, we think that you know you're not going to see you know a, a virtual MSO pop up for a twenty dollar uh, a month subscription. Certainly not with fresh content, right? right. Uh, you know, we think with fresh content, you're going to pay, and you guys all know the numbers on, on what you pay in aggregate carriage fees, and you can back into you know, some premium on top of that, or they take it on the chin for a while. Uh, but you know, th those are the, the effective laws of physics in our industry. Uh, and so this you know, $30 a month to get all the really cool stuff that I've always wanted but somehow can't get uh, is just not going to happen. That's, I think, what, you know, where yeah. we go back to the, well, if I'm still going to pay Comcast for internet, and I'm going to have to pay somebody else for the other stuff, and it's going to start to get really expensive for this new virtual you know, guy to be able to deliver content into Comcast network. Uh, that's you know, as I talk about the net neutrality problem. We think that's a problem that we're going to be struggling with in the industry over time. And that's going to play out over the next five to ten years. Nora, what's your I, thought? I think uh, absolutely yes. There'll, there'll be at least one entrant. And I think it will be a very long horizon <laughs> that it will take to actually find its way in. But I think it's inevitable in the same way that you just see this march forward from cable to satellite to telco. Those telephone companies, it took them, I think, two decades before they really hit it. And, and now, uh, you, uh, I love Verizon, love it, um, but it took them two decades to, to do. The companies that have the deepest pockets and, and, and can strike the deals, it's going to take a while. I agree, I don't think the pricing is going to be dramatically different, but um, I do think that there will be a new wave. Cool. We have about uh, 
10 minutes, so um, before we go into any more questions, I wanted to open it up for questions from the audience. Oh, we covered everything. Alan. <laughs> you guys are talking about MVPD or network apps as an either or proposition. Do you think you could have both where you know, the MVPD is Simon and Company and they own them all? And yes. The different networks that have basically set up their apps within the mall, and that's how you, you get that experience. I, I think Ab absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for the foreseeable future, that's the model you're going to have. Yeah. Because you come, you come for different reasons. <coughs> if I want to see Duck Dynasty, I might recognize it's on A&E, and I might go find my a and &E app. If I'm kind of wanting to watch something and I'm not quite sure what, I might come and browse, and then I'd come to my MVPD app. Right, but see, I'm thinking a situation where I go to my MVPD app and then find the a &E, the Duck Dynasty, within that, which then opens up an a &E created experience rather than a Comcast-created experience. And you're essentially talking that uh, Comcast would become the discovery engine, right, where yeah. you, you navigate and you send traffic you know, right, over to the a and &E app. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we settle on that model and similarly in the a and &E, app, as I mentioned before, you then have, you know, Comcast has control of a, a navigation system, for example, to drive traffic back, right? Because there's a, a right, ton of value. Right, not only going to want to watch it. Right, you wanted to, as a, an MVPD, you want to distribute that, that consumption across your networks and not keep it all, you know, essentially isolated to one. Right. Uh, so over time, I, I think we'll, we'll start to feel that out, and, and maybe there will, will even be standards over the course of time, but I think you're going to find a lot of folks, you know, are, are taking shots at different approaches to, to try and figure out the right balance over time because it, it is very confusing for the consumer to try and figure out which app and you know I, I can get some of your guys content in mm -hmm. uh, the Comcast app but some in, in you know, your app and what's a better experience it, it is confusing for the consumer. So you envision an MVPD playing a, the discovery engine role just, uh, to, just to put a fine point on your comment Sean. I think they could use some help. Okay. okay. I have lots of business cards. So yeah. No, <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So broadcasters have regulatory issues they have to deal with, things like the Com Act, <coughs> Accessibility Acts. As you start to look at, you know, providing TV everywhere, do you see that, or have you seen that? Are you preparing for that potentially impacting your TV everywhere uh, offerings? Are you, ref are you what, what type of regulations are you referring to? Like, like the Com Act, right, which is loudness on commercials. Uh, right, so yeah. <clears throat> Comcast has to, and every other broadcaster has to deal with that. Or another really good example very recently, right, was uh, regulations passed around closed captions, closed captions. Mm -hmm. right, that, that just hit, I think, pretty much every broadcaster in, in network, uh, at least domestically here. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are the, it, it's catching up. Uh, I think, you know, a number of folks have been really good about staying ahead of regulations, uh, just for the sheer benefit of their consumers. But it, over time, the lines are going to blur. And there's, online is just a different pipe, mm -hmm. ultimately over time. And I think that's where we're settling on. It's just going to take a little bit of time for the regulatory side to catch up. Go ahead. With the MVPDs all ultimately going to a TV everywhere model, there's no POD for them anymore. Do you see a time where they're asking for something proprietary from you and proprietary from you and a fragmentation of your product line across those different providers? Sorry, just to clarify, a P-O-D? Uh, point of differentiation. Gotcha, thank you. Okay. Um, looking, looking for something exclusive for yes. the MVPD that we don't give to the other MVPD? On Xfinity, uh, mm -hmm. we not only have what everyone else has, but we have this extra content from A&E or from Epics. So, so Comcast could differentiate against somebody else who's in market like a Fios or a direct or even against the network directly keeping keeping wow. in with the theme of this is sort of just an evolutionary new platform there's a little bit of that that gets negotiated with every deal anyway you're putting together special marketing considerations you're putting together specific kinds of additional programming considerations and I, I, I don't think it's like we never did it and now we will start doing it I think I think it's part of a continuum and um, the, 
the, the different MVPDs will have their different kinds of priorities and might be looking for certain kinds of things. The network fundamentally still stays the network. But can I give you some actual bonus material that's just for you? Yes, I think that'll be part of negotiations. I'll say it. We're, I'm surprised right now that nobody's uh, done slicing on uh, quality. Right? So we do windowing, for example, based you know, windowing of content. And you can you know, negotiate for a week or a month or so on earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and we limit uh, the quality of the content you distribute, oftentimes based on the, the content protection mechanisms on the device. Right? You know, if it's an, uh, on an Android phone, an old Android phone, it can only be SD. Uh, I still haven't seen anybody, maybe you guys are seeing this more, uh, but I haven't seen anybody say yet, I will pay extra to be the only pr uh, distributor of 4K content mm -hmm. for the first month. And let everybody else have HD. What about That's the, a differentiator. Uh, the, I forgot what to call it, the Netflix cable vision deal where they, they put part of their CDN in the a, a cable vision plant and the consumer can get the, whatever Netflix calls it, the silver or the, the higher tier. The, the higher, is that yeah. the kind of opportunity Similar, you're talking right? about? I think it, 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 I think it has a, a much larger impact when you go not necessarily for, for Netflix's con content library, but for you know everything that you see in the TV everywhere world. Because okay. this is you know this is the the hot premium just released content, and if I'm the only one that has 4K over the next two years, and I'm then you know my uh, contract uh, agreements protect me to have that as a, a unique offering. Yeah, I, I think that's a huge differentiator. Yeah, I, I would just say we're not looking to do carve-outs, generally. Uh, life would get difficult. There are also a lot of uh, MFN clauses mm -hmm. in these deals. Mm -hmm. So um, That does limit your latitude in a big way. I also think that at this stage of the game, everybody is struggling to figure it out. And I'm not so sure that, I, I, I think you're right that, this, that, that, that those kinds of offerings would be very sophisticated and interesting. Mm -hmm. I think they're a step ahead of where well, yeah. the typical distributors mm -hmm. are ready to even figure it out. I don't think they're technologically, marketing-wise, I just, I just don't think they're able to go there yet. Right. You had a question? Yeah, Evan, you mentioned additive streams, not cannibalistic. Yep. Um, that's in the digital environment. <laughs> Have you seen any impact in the linear ratings in the markets with the MVPDs that are? So we've, we've excuse me, we've done some tests um, in spe with specific MVPDs where we've done some sneak peeks and things like that. And we have found it to, again, actually help with ratings. The linear ratings have, in turn, been higher in that specific market. Um, we're very careful about it. Linear ratings are still the obviously the lion's share of our revenue. Um, so it's something we monitor extremely closely. But no, we have not found it to be a detriment. We found it the exact opposite. It's actually helped raise awareness, get people engaged in series, et cetera. So. Oh, can I actually make a comment? Because that reminded me of um, the cannibalization topic <coughs> that we had before, yep. right? Which is, uh, to be clear, when I say we, you know, uh, we very much believe in cannibalization. I think it, it means something different than, than uh, what Evan was talking to. You know, having come from, from Google prior, uh, you know, we're always told that online video has no impact on TV consumption, and, and, and there's no such thing as cannibalization. Uh, but the average American watches four and a half to five hours of, of TV a day, and at some point you just run out of time. Uh, so you know, at some point we very much do have a cannibalization effect. Uh, but that's not to say that it's a zero-sum game, which I, th I think is more what, what Evan's talking to here, which is uh, we are displacing other forms of entertainment. We are providing access to content uh, at additional time slots throughout the day uh, that provides that, you know, will ultimately take that four and a half hours a day and slide that up maybe to six or even seven hours a day over the course of time, right? And that may be a 10 year model. Uh, so we, we do see it shifting from a, a time invested perspective from the consumer. Uh, but that's why, the, you know, it, it's certainly a little bit grayer territory than, you know, Yes, there is cannibalization, or no, there is not, uh, yeah. and that's the things we have to be careful about. Got a yeah. question here? I do. I have another question for Evan. Are you capturing C3 ratings from your TV experience? Um, most of what we're, we're most of it we're monetizing through sort of traditional digital means. No, we're, we're not through C3. Okay. So. Any plans to do that? Um, there are lots of plans to do lots of things. I mean, I mean, yes. This is the ultimate question: is is Nielsen? going to be the default 
um, sort of metric and you know could you roll it into one metric and yeah, we'll see how it plays out. And so. once that plays out, then we're going to hit a whole new level in momentum on TV everywhere. <coughs> the other huge reason right. why not right now. Some devices are uh, getting integrated into mm -hmm. Nielsen's people meter measurements. I'll but it's, I would say it's still very much a work in progress. Tablets and mobile are right. all the <laughs> Huge deterrent. We got time for maybe one last question. Otherwise, we can wrap. Any, any last question? Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>